So my name's Candice. I'm the president. Uh, we're really happy that we can try and deliver to some members uh, these presentations that we had lined up. So um, the first person we have lined up today is Noah Stevens. He is the co-founder and lead developer at 3D Wave Design. Noah was, uh, I've been speaking with Noah for, for quite some time now. Uh, he was going to present at our uh, BIM uh, seminar, which was supposed to happen in February and then again this month. Uh, and so instead we've decided to roll them out online uh, because what, what real option do we have right now? Um, so it's really great to see everybody here. We didn't really know how well it would go. Uh, so Noah is uh, our, our very first speaker. He is a uh, Mi'kmaq born in Nova Scotia. He is a very experienced app developer, programmer, uh, 3D artist and animator. He was telling me some of his background work uh, here that he's done in the Valley um, before, before everybody arrived. Sounds really, really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so he does have a background in filmmaking. So he knows a mm -hmm. lot about uh, 3D visualizations and things like that. I first met Noah's dad, Barry Stevens, when I worked for AGRG, doing some visualizations on uh, uh, flooding and storm surge, um, mm -hmm. uh, so climate change, because it's really hard to model water and make it look realistic. So we were really interested mm -hmm. in, in what you guys and what your group could do. Um, so I, he'll give more background into the company. Um, so without former, uh, any, any more ado, he is going to talk about improving climate risk communication with interactive 3D mapping. Perfect, okay. Yeah, so uh, Candice uh, pretty well covered it. Um, there's an interesting story on how this business uh, came to be. Um, and I think that's what makes our company unique and, and also the product offering relatively unique. Um, so like she said, my background is in filmmaking. Uh, and I've been doing uh, editing and 3D animation uh, uh, for uh, commercials uh, and for smaller productions for a while. Uh, and sort of with that, I was programming a lot of task automation uh, for my 3D work uh, in Blender. Um, and then in 2012, 13, I, I branched off and I wasn't working within the uh, film industry as much anymore. And I was getting more uh, smaller projects through uh, freelancing. Uh, I actually uh, formed a uh, company with my wife, Lena Ali, who's also a co-founder of uh, 3D Wave Design. Uh, and later on, we brought my uh, father on board, whose uh, background is in electronic engineering, Barry Stevens. Uh, he's the president of Stevens Solutions and Design, the parent company of 3D Wave Design. And uh, just for some context, uh, my wife's background is in journalism. So in the beginning, uh, our, our product offering was unique in the sense that we were doing uh, 3D technical animations for industry, local industry, and uh, international industry. So some of our clients include Stellia Aerospace, uh, GN Plastics, um, and what we would do is come in as consultants, work with the client on a pain point, like a selling pain point for their product, and then bring in all of the uh, 3D CAD data for the, their, their manufacturing and we'd make it one-to-one -one scale uh, in our virtual environment and we would basically visualize their, their product working and, and, and emphasize the selling points and that they were able to have this uh, video for promotion on their website and take it to um, uh, conferences abroad and we've had great success doing that. Um, so as we were doing that uh, over the years, we had an opportunity um, uh, to work with uh, Tim Webster's group uh, from AGRG in Middleton. And uh, we were looking at ways that we could help them visualize some data. And uh, in that process, uh, we started doing some research. And we were sort of uh, in awe of the uh, Most things were still printed on a PDF. Those those maps were still, uh, you know, a smaller scale 2D, um, and that a lot of the visualization tools that existed for the actual end user, like the municipalities or the citizens, wasn't necessarily in lockstep with uh, 
the super awesome technology that existed for collecting the data. So we, we did our, our research and we started developing a product that essentially uh, is a platform for people to consolidate their, their information um, uh, and visualize their data on the web. And we have done a lot of optimizations to make sure that this data uh, is very, very accurate and very, very performant on um, commercial level uh, desktops and laptops and mobile devices. Because ultimately, the importance of, of disseminating environmental data is making sure that everyone has access to it. And just because you have a link to your product doesn't necessarily mean it's going to run on their computer. So we've made some uh, pretty great strides developing the software uh, using some, some really powerful uh, web APIs. And uh, we've had some great success actually delivering product to uh, local municipalities, uh, Mahone Bay uh, and First Nations. Um, and that's some more context about myself and my father. Um, we are uh, members of Acadia Band, we're Mi'kmaq. And so this is an indigenous owned and operated company as well. So we've actually done work and are continuing to do work for uh, Atlantic First Nation groups. And um, yeah, and what I'd like to do if we have time is I'll actually uh, take you to, I don't know if any of you have been on our page yet, but this is a really great video that sort of uh, shows off our product. And I'll play that before I actually demo the, the maps. I'm just going to pause it here because that's pretty much it. Um, and I'll get out of that. So yeah, so essentially what, we're, what we've done is um, we, have, we have built web software for taking in uh, digital elevation models, uh, visualizing them, uh, and then also uh, visualizing uh, the associated um, climate change uh, data as well. And so a good example of what we've done uh, last year, up here so this is running in the browser and I'm not exactly sure how smooth it is for you guys through zoom but this is running at uh, 120 frames here so essentially the user is able to come in um, we have all these pins for context and data so they can click on a pin there's the associated information uh, they're able to access uh, images I'll move this little tab here um, and so what we've done is Uh, they, there's hyperlinks they can click to uh, that take them to PDFs and reports. 
Uh, we've embedded historical information uh, and photos into our application as well. Exit out of that. And there are also videos that have been done that have been embedded into this as well. So this is a climate change study that was done uh, by our company around three years ago. And I won't play the whole thing, but yeah, that's also embedded into the app as well. But the, this, this is where the power comes from. So I'm gonna highlight the reserve land. And so we were commissioned to do this piece because they were planning on doing developments within this area. And this dam is actually uh, regulated by NS Power. So the water levels that you're seeing now uh, were when the LIDAR was flown uh, back in 2016. But they're wondering if, the, if the, the levels were to ever change or the dam was to be breached, what would happen? So I have a, a height uh, modifier over here for the water levels and it's in meters. And I can start to flood the inland areas, the Greenfield Elementary School. But what's interesting here, if I just exit out of that, is that you really can't see the flooding happening in the canopy. Uh, um, so you can, so I can turn that off and you can see through the canopy where the flooding is actually happening. So they're able to consolidate with engineers and emergency management people and actually input the data and see if their development or their planned development is actually going to be impacted uh, by any change in the, uh, the regulated uh, river. We've also built into the tool that I'm quite happy about is we're getting into fire simulations. So we built a fire simulator uh, based off of Byram's equation. It, it factors in uh, convection, uh, heat, burnability, uh, elevation. And we've used the, the LIDAR uh, point cloud as a way to sort of classify trees and, uh, and burnability. And we're not making this technology to predict fires, but we're trying to create this technology for EMO uh, tabletop uh, scenarios. So uh, the person that we're working with is able to take this application to the community, run some real time, uh, uh, simulations of the fire and then basically derive a, a plan of action for the community on what to do. So I'll run through one of these simulations right now. I'll move this over here. So what we're able to do here is to select the location of the fire, which I'm actually going to place over here. There we go. And you're given a wind compass. And so with this, there's all these variables here for the uh, dryness of the surrounding area, the simulation speed, the wind strength. I'm going to start the, uh, the fire from uh, the west, so that's where the prevalent wind is, and I'm going to increase the wind strength, and I'm going to start the fire simulation. And so what this is doing, it's calculating where the trees are and uh, what's considered burnable, and it's burning through that. And what we're really happy about this tool is it's not a baked simulation in the sense that I push the button and, and it's going to play out. Uh, uh, until I stop the simulation, it's actually dynamic. So I can change the, uh, the wind direction and lower the speed or raise the speed. So I'm actually gonna change the, the direction of the fire and how it's burning right now. And so this uh, allows the EMO professionals to, uh, to basically adjust their scenarios need be. And it's also a great way for the community to understand what's potentially at risk. Um, because a lot of the times they don't really get uh, a true orthographic view of their community. Uh, and if they do, it, these simulations are usually represented in ve vectors, uh, which sort of needs to be translated by uh, an EMO person. It's not really visually friendly. So what we're trying to do is sort of democratize data in a sense and help people better understand uh, risks, uh, climate risks, and then sort of act accordingly. So, this is not, this tool is not meant to replace engineering studies, but it's to spark conversations in order to properly engage uh, engineering uh, uh, firms and companies. And hopefully in the future, because uh, we're, we're currently building our application programming interface to allow people to take their data directly and, and put it in, into this instead of having us sort of do the custom maps. So I'm gonna pause this simulation right now. 
So um, I will show you some other demos that we've done and some of the other features, but one of the exciting uh, developments that we're currently doing right now is our software was sort of dependent on these uh, 3D models to be generated by a third party uh, piece of software, typically open source, but we are now able to generate these 3D models based off of digital elevation raster data in the browser real time uh, and then fetch the, uh, fetch the according um, uh, satellite imagery or, or parse through orthophotos. So essentially citizen scientists could go and download uh, GeoNova uh, LiDAR data and drag and drop it into our web tool and get, uh, get the relevant uh, three models from that for download, which could be used because they're all positioned accurately in world space uh, in, in another piece of software such as Esri. So I'm gonna exit out of this. I'm gonna showcase Pondhook. Um, this is data that was actually flown by Tim's group and we're visualizing it in our soft software here. And what's cool here is that it gives the user uh, two variables to play with. Uh, there is the, uh, the uh, river uh, or the Lake Rosignol um, slider here, which you can adjust. And then down here, there's another body of water that's regulated by the dam that, that they can adjust for EMO training. And sort of uh, like the other demo that I uh, mentioned, there are uh, settings that you can use and toggle to figure out where the reserve boundaries are and what's being affected. And our first project actually was for the municipality of Mon Bay. And the cool thing about this one is that we built in uh, with GPS coordination, uh, coordinates uh, where their, their lift stations were. So this is, these are electric lift stations in relation to their, uh, their sewer plants. So I can turn on the lift stations uh, and as they're adjusting the tide, which the, the ocean water here that you see is actually, um, there's a regional offset applied to it. So it's as accurate as we could make it for a bathtub model. I can rise the tide levels to a meter and then put in the storm surge of 2.6 meters, and then all of a sudden the lift stations have gone off. So this tool, this, this generalized tool, is allowing um, our users in the municipality to get information from tide charts and CBC weather. So essentially, they could click on this live link to CBC weather and get the predicted um, storm surge and the predicted tide levels for this particular day, put it into our program to get an approximation of what could happen. Uh, and we like to uh, show historical photos um, of what did happen too, as well. Uh, so this is a, an older flood that happened in 58, where you can actually see the water breached and you got all the way past the, uh, the cenotaph into the uh, uh, Main Street area. And this is uh, Hurricane Dorian. And one of the things when, when my father is, uh, is showcasing this technology, is to give people perspective on um, uh, the storm that never happened, uh, Juan. It, it went over to Halifax in the early 2000s, but what was predicted for no Nova Scotia was an insane amount of uh, storm surge. And we didn't really prepare for it in the town because uh, I forget exactly what the, how high in terms of meters it was, but we were putting up sandbags that were like two feet high. Uh, that we're not really going to stop the water if, if the actual predicted storm surge was going to happen. Um, so with this tool, you'd be able to better understand if the water is going to breach or not. And, uh, oh yeah, we've also, in this particular demo, we've done, there's some, uh, there's some river data here, and there's the Ernst Brook, and we can breach that as well. And come in here and look at the affected houses. And then also, uh, there is a resiliency map that's built into this that allows the emergency management people to figure out which zone is being affected. Uh, this is a program that's being done specifically by and adopted by Mahone Bay and is very project specific. I'm going to turn this off. I'll lower everything right now. Another key innovation that we're doing is uh, we're more uh, hydrodynamic simulations uh, in the browser. So typically, if there was something that was more complicated than a bathtub sim, we'd have to bring in that data that was crunched from a product like DHI and Mike. Uh, however, we're looking at uh, building uh, very similar simulations that can be calculated uh, uh, 
with uh, multi-threaded calculations in the browser. So the water will actually channel and flow in the right areas, and we're, we're currently getting funding for that and working on that as well. Um, but that's keeping this sort of relatively in, uh, informal. That's all I have to show at the, at the present. I'm wondering if anyone has any questions. That is very neat, Noah. I, uh, I really like uh, the idea, especially to separate out the brook tiding from the tide, hmm. from the storm surge, um, because it can be really confusing to combine all of those three together, especially tide and storm surge. Uh, people don't of, uh, often know what, you know, how to do that. <laughs> so, hmm. but they can see what the tide level is on an app and then they could hear what the storm surge uh, is going to be like on the news or whatnot, um, and then come and do it themselves. That's very neat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're hoping that this technology can be used to uh, to help people better understand uh, the risks, um, and then also um, in the future allow people uh, from the GIS community to input their data directly to um, instead. Of, so instead of, for example, having a static model on Sketchfab or or an NS product, uh, they can have something a bit more dynamic. Um, yeah, and also very mobile friendly. So this runs really, really we uh, well on older generation uh, Android devices as well. That's great. Thanks very much, Noah. My name's Scott. I don't know if you can see me in one of the little cubes. Hi. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Um, I, I was just kind of curious uh, what what stack is it built on? And uh, you mentioned democratizing visualization of climate risk. Can you talk a little bit about some of the reactions you've got, not from you know coastal managers or from you know or from engineers, but the reaction from people who are used to, I guess, not getting the yeah. vectors, as you say. Um, what, what is that response? That's, been? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, uh, and it's been very interesting reactions, too. I think municipalities are very used to receiving traditional written reports with pictures and, and vectors. Um, and so when they see this, um, they're, they're immediately like, they, they understand uh, what, what's happening. Um, there's been acceptance and pushback from the uh, GIS and the scientific community. There's been uh, perceived threat or there's been an attempt to sort of uh, overgeneralize uh, uh, the bathtub simulations. Um, but our, our technology isn't attempting to replace any of these professional studies uh, or institutions. We're hopefully just trying to bridge the gap between what's being done uh, by the GIS community and how it's delivered to uh, the, the citizens, the emergency management people in the municipalities. Um, We've had very, very excited and positive uh, uh, feedback from municipalities. We're currently working with CBCL and Lunenburg on visualizing mitigation for a wastewater treatment plant there. So we're actually going to allow the user to, in real time, uh, visualize uh, the, the wastewater treatment plant flooding and then what would happen if uh, the mitigation um, measures were, were put in, so like a seawall or a berm and actually water, see the water properly displaced in the right areas and see the, uh, the wastewater treatment plant properly protected. Um, so, and that, that application is being delivered to the town of, uh, of Lunenburg so they can decide whether or not that they want to go through uh, with uh, you know, a series of, of suggested uh, remediation or, or, or protection plans. Um, we have great response uh, from indigenous communities who know that their land is very low lying and it's, it's not the most desirable land. But uh, we did one project uh, where there was a community called Wildcat and uh, the, it's very swampy and marshy. And if you just offset the river enough, uh, and it's happened before, you can see a lot of their land becomes uh, uninhabitable. Um, so they were able to be a little bit more educated on, on the risks for their community that was outside of the main road. Um, yeah, we've had uh, uh, very, very positive uh, reception, uh, but then also we saw a, a little bit of defensiveness too, but we're hoping uh, in the end to just be helping create a tool that makes people better understand the data. 
And what was the stack you, you used to build the tool? Yes, uh, sorry, I didn't answer that. So yeah, we're using uh, a, a 3D graphical API uh, called Babylon. It's created by Microsoft. Um, they, uh, they, do re they do WebGL very, very well. Uh, the user interface uh, is being built with uh, React, uh, and uh, we are using Webpack to sort of bundle everything together. And uh, we can also deliver uh, native applications to uh, through Electron, which sort of bundles everything together, and you can actually get access to, uh, it's not exactly native native, but you can still get access to uh, uh, a lot of uh, system stuff that you couldn't with the web API, so. Perfect, thanks. Yeah. That's great. Does anyone else have any questions for Noah? I have a question about the fire uh, application and to tier work. Yeah. So that, yeah. that looks really useful. Uh, are there, is EMO using that now? We, uh, I cannot speak to the, the projects that we are hopefully applying for and we've been asked to, to apply for, but yes, it was received very well. Excellent. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a big concern and, and growing something I think probably has been overlooked for a long time. So it's nice to see somebody doing some work. Yeah, well, hopefully with the dynamic nature of our tool, um, if you could, uh, how I see it being used is you could run through simulations, like I had mentioned, but you could sort of toggle um, on or off uh, uh, firewalls or protection for communities and see how that would actually affect the fire. Um, because a lot of times uh, the, the fire can be perceived to be very far away, but if you change enough uh, variables uh, like wind speed and, and height, um, fire can climb up a mountain very, very, very quickly. Um, so we're hoping to help people better understand uh, risks uh, involving that kind of stuff. Great. That's great. Anyone else have any questions? If you wanted to type them in the chat, you can do so as well. Wonderful. Well, this was most interesting, Noah. Thank you very much for, uh, for sharing your knowledge and background and experience with us. We really appreciate that. Yeah, uh, no that's, problem. Yeah, that's really, uh, really great to hear about Lunenburg and the wastewater treatment plant and, and you know, so many applications for awesome 3D visualizations these days. Yeah. Other Thank than you. video games. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's another thing entirely is that it's definitely a, can be associated as something uh, kind of frivolous, um, and uh, yeah, we're we're looking to sort of break out of that too. Absolutely, great. It, I, I noticed it was interesting in that Lunenburg RFP. It was the first one I'd seen that specifically asked for three D visualization as opposed to flood risk mapping, which was sort of a more traditional yeah. one. But they specifically put in the RFP three dimensional visualization. So yeah, it, yeah. It's well, we might have. Uh, we might have influenced that in the sense that we've been demoing <laughs> quite a bit. Um, I see. <laughs> yeah, and so the more town hall meetings we go to and the more we show this off to municipalities, the more people go, wow, I think I might refer, uh, prefer this rather than a, uh, a traditional written report. And uh, yeah, I would, I would honestly, my, my hopes and dreams of this, this product is to build something that people can, can use something like this to get their report out there. So they, so this is really not just visualization. I also like using the term platform. I'm hoping this can become a platform for sharing this kind of information. Mm -hmm. 